So, welcome to lecture number 13, which is uh, the first lecture of capsule number 7 after <coughs> the mid sim. Today, we are looking at three components of a flight gliding, climbing, and sealing. Okay. So, again, this presentation has been prepared by uh, this student called Odit Vohra. We are already familiar with him because if you recall, he was the one who made the presentation on the atmosphere also. This is the second presentation that he prepared for me uh, while he was here as an intern during this summer. Okay. So, the layout is very straightforward. We are going to look at some birds. We are going to look at how they glide, then how they climb and what are the limits to their altitude of employment or the operative ceiling. That is all the three things today. So, let us see the gliding flight. This is how aircraft glide. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So, what exactly is gliding flight? Not hitting somebody with a thermocol plane. That is not a gliding flight. Gliding flight is basically the art of silent flight or flight without any thrust. In the history of aviation, I have spoken a lot about Otto Lilienthal and so many other people. They were the ones who perfected the aerodynamics of flight by learning how to glide. And it is only later on that sustained flights were possible because of the provision of power plant on the aircraft. But if you really want to enjoy flight and if you want to test your skill or airmanship as we say, then gliding flight is the most challenging and exciting thing. Okay. So, even though glide is a very silent flight, still we have forces acting on the aircraft in the glide and this is a dramatical representation. So, we do not glide like this. Okay. This is a very large angle, but just to increase the visibility, we have an aircraft which is operating at an angle with the horizontal. It is uh, mass acts downwards towards the center of the earth and from the flight path perpendicular would be the lift force. The drag force would be along the flight path opposing the flight and the angle between the path at which it operates or glides in this case with the horizontal is the flight path angle or in this case the sink angle or the gliding angle theta. Not sink angle that is the wrong thing, it is a gliding angle theta. Okay. So, if you resolve the forces on an aircraft during glide, we can see that there is a, the lift component will be W sin cos, cos theta and the drag W sin theta T will be 0. So, straight away we get tan of theta would be 1 by L by D. Okay. I have not said D by L because we are interested in L by D as a parameter. You could always say tan theta is equal to D by L where theta is the gliding angle. So, obviously, if you want to have a low tan theta, which means if you want to have a lower glide path angle, you would like to have higher L by D. So, L by D is directly controlling the angle during the glide. So, hence aircraft with higher L by D will be in general gliding at a lower angle theta compared to aircraft with the lower L by D. Okay. So, when you glide, you actually cover some horizontal distance in glide from the point where you start to the point where you hit the ground. The horizontal distance on the ground is called as the range in a glide and the range is going to increase when either the theta reduces or when the L by D max increases. In other words, if you are gliding at a condition such that L by D is L by D max, you will get the least angle of theta and longest range during glide. Okay. So, that is uh, now how do you know at what angle I should fly, at what angle of attack I should fly, so that L by D is L by D max. For a pilot, it is very difficult to know. So, the pilot determines this only by speed and also by flight experience or flying experience. Another important point is after your glide starts, how much time can you stay in the air? That is called as the sink rate or the 
rate at which you lose the altitude dh by dt sink rate. So, it is very obvious that if your sink rate is low you may travel distance less or more we do not care, but you will be in the air for maximum time after your glide starts. So, it is not necessary that the distance travelled will be the largest when you are operating at the minimum sink rate. The distance travelled is a function of only L by D and the angle glide angle theta, but the sink rate during glide is a function of dh by dt. So, we will see we will derive the expression. So, from the previous uh, figure you know where we had L equal to half rho V square S C L okay, and W cos theta not equal to W, but W cos theta it is equal to W when you have theta equal to 0 or when you are in level flight. And we also know that tan theta is equal to 1 by L by D. So, that means sin theta upon cos theta is equal to 1 by L by D. So, cos theta will be uh, you can replace it. Now, dh by dt as you can see from the previous figure is actually the sink rate V sin theta. So, I take sin theta as cos theta into 1 by L by D put it inside. Now, you can push this cos theta inside it will become cos square theta uh, cos cube theta rather hmm. and there is L and D. So, L contains C L you can replace L by D by C L by C D. So, you will get C L cube also inside, but suppose for example, a situation where theta is very small which is normally the case in the case of gliding. Okay. So, now we want to find the condition at which what should be the C L and hence what should be the V because V and C L are connected to each other what should be the C L at which I get the maximum sink rate and I am assuming that cos theta is almost equal to 1. So, therefore, this expression will now become minus root of 2 w C L rho s into C D by C L outside. So, C D square comes in C D square and C L square. So, there will be a cube there. Okay. So, dh by dt will become minus 2 w by rho s c d by c l power 3 by 2. This is a familiar ratio. We had this ratio also for the minimum power required in flight. Okay. So, hence it is interesting that you can get the condition at which the sink rate will be minimum. So, the range in the glide is maximum when you fly at c l by c d maximum. The endurance or the sink endurance is maximum or the sink rate is minimum when you fly at a condition at which C D L C L 3 by 2 by C D is maximum because that maximum will give you the lowest d h by d t. So, the conditions are not the same as I mentioned a few minutes ago okay. and you can derive this expression by going further into it you can get this expression. So, the L by d for maximum endurance will be approximately 0 0.866 times L by D max. Okay. So, you do not fly at max L by D, but you fly at around 86 percent of the max of L by D. Okay. Now, just to get some idea about sink rate and how it changes, I have taken one of the most successful gliders in the world called as the Schweizer SGS 126. This is a old version, there is a new version called as 1-36. This aircraft went out of production many years ago. There is a better version available, but this is one of the world's most famous and popular gliders. So, let us see how does the sink rate of this glider change for various uh, conditions. So, the same glider I have shown under four conditions, or what are these conditions? Basically, these conditions are the speeds at which you fly. Remember for the pilot there is nothing like what is C L by C D maximum, what is C L 3 by 2 by C D maximum. These ratios are only for us those who do analysis or performance calculations or those who do design. For the pilot everything is speed. So, the pilot relates speed to L by D. So, the pilot is told that if you want to glide maximum distance glide at this particular speed. If you want to be in the air for maximum time glide at this particular speed, then your sink rate will be the minimum. So, you can see the sink rate can be 
between 1.8 knots to 3.2 knots. Now, knots is a standard speed unit for aviation. Those of you who do not understand knots or do not appreciate knots, just multiply it by almost 1.853 or let us say by 2 to get kilometers per hour. So, you will get an idea about or oh, sorry meter per second. Okay. So, it will give you an idea just multiply by almost 2 to get in meter per second that is what probably you are more familiar with. So, the air speed you can see the 4 colors shown there also correspond to how much distance is covered in the glide. So, when the aircraft is uh, gliding it can cover around 6000 feet. All of them began from the same altitude, but they hit the ground at different uh, distances depending on the speed at which they are traveling. Okay. Right. So, while we are at this particular point I wanted to just share some excitement with you about uh, gliding and soaring. So, can someone tell me the difference between these two terms as far as the aviation is concerned? What is meant by gliding and what is meant by soaring? What do you think? Anyone? The mics are all around here. So, I will give you an example. The birds are soaring and the aircraft are gliding in general. Okay. Aircraft normally do not soar, they only glide, but birds are the ones that are champions in soaring. So, now do you get yes, what is your what is your view? Yes. So, my name is Atharva. I think soaring means using only an air to push birds to speeds of fast moving to but means do not use it. Yeah, okay. That's that's very much close, and it's correct actually. Essentially, uh, anybody wants to add to this? Soaring and gliding. So pretty much, pretty much true what he said, but one can elaborate it a little bit more. So in gliding, you are only sinking down continuously. You can minimize the sink rate or you can maximize the range, okay. but you are always coming down. It is a continuous downward spiral, but soaring is something where you can even go up or you can maintain the altitude for a very long time. So, that you cannot do unless you have a power plant, but power plants cannot be there in gliders. So, then we use ambient wind. So, if you are able to maintain your altitude in air in a power off situation for a very long time, mainly using the thermals as you said or upward drafts of air, then you are soaring. Okay. But you should do this without any power, neither flapping. So, birds when they soar, the eagles which they soar, they do not flap their wings, they are not using the propulsive power to keep up, they are basically looking at the currents. So, sometimes they glide and then they soar and then they glide and then they soar. Okay. So, we try to emulate them in the gliders, but we also have a category of aircraft called as sail planes. We have gliders and we have sail planes. So, what do you think is the difference between a glider and a sail plane? What is a glider and what is a sail plane? A sail plane is a very advanced glider. A very efficient glider is called as a sail plane because sail planes are designed essentially for soaring and gliders are designed basically for gliding. Okay. But each can do the other thing also subject to the flying skills. Now, since there is no power plant available or since there is no means of thrust then there are three ways of launching or three ways of operating a glider or a sail plane. The first way is called as winch launch. This is the most common one 
and let us have a look at what is meant by winch launch. Hey, this is Bruno. I'm excited to share with you what we've been working on over Volume the last year. We've spent literally hundreds of man hours refurbishing this old glider winch, and now we're winching out of Nephi, Utah. So these guys have made and, a new uh, winch. If you're from Europe or the yeah, UK, this video is you're about their winch. no big deal. You they see have this designed a the new time. winch, and but they are going to test it. If you're from the now. US, check this out. Now, this is going to blow your mind. Some of you who mind. are not very much, you will see very beautiful view, views here, and some people. All out, all out, all out. See, that's good. Now that's kind of anemic. Now that's good. Now we can, now I can pull up. Do you think the cable is still attached? Or is it released? That's a steeper. Still attached. You cannot see it right now. It's in the north. still attached because the winch is at the end of the runway I wasn't exaggerating when I said how stinking amazing this is here the glider is climbing faster than an airliner taking off uh, we have about 8,000 feet of rope on the drum right now. We can do as much as 11,000 feet. And with that, we can get many thousands of feet in the air above the airport with just a single launch. At this point of the launch, we're now getting towards the top, and so the glider starts to roll forward to get ready to release the rope. So now the glider and, is almost uh, vertical. You can see, you can actually hear it. it almost. It off. As as so here's the release right here. Break, we would be full forward. That was a back release. There it goes. And, we got and now we're free. So we just point, push the nose down so that way we can maintain airspeed. And I'm going to raise the main gear, which you can see underneath us. Landing there it goes right there. Inside. And now we're free to soar with the birds and fly for many hours. We're thousands of feet above the airport. We have plenty of altitude to go find a thermal and enjoy the day. Hey, thanks for joining us and uh, hope you enjoyed this video. So now, just a simple question. There is a winch which is pulling the aircraft. When the winch, when the rope becomes almost vertical, the rope is released and now the glider is free to fly. How much time do you think it can keep flying? There is no power plant. What do you think? So is there a limit to how long can you stay in the air? What is that limit? Come on, you can guess. So let me ask you a disciplinary manner. What is required so that you do not come down? Upward draft of air. Okay. Is there a limit to how much upward draft of air is available in nature? There is no limit. It all depends upon weather conditions, location and where you are. So what do you think is the world record for maximum glide after a launch? How many hours do you think it has been possible for a person to stay in the air after launching? Take a guess. So is it like 2 hours or is it 4 hours? Eight hours. Can you stay for eight hours? Yes, you can. There is no limit. It could be actually even 20 hours. It all depends on where you are flying, what is the condition. If you keep getting thermals, you can keep up in the air. 
So the question for you on Moodle is what is the world record for soaring after a launch? Okay. Let us see how many hours people have been able to stay up in the air after a single launch. Right. Yeah, yeah. Winch is not shown. Winch is basically a drum. Winch is a drum on which you wind a rope or a cable and then that at the end of the runway you put that and using an electrical motor you wind it at high speed. So it pulls the aircraft. As it pulls the aircraft, the aircraft gains altitude. So the cable is still connected and then when it reaches some height you release it. There is a hook in the aircraft, the pilot releases it. So the rope falls and the aircraft is already up. So it can glide. So winch basically is a thing that pulls, a drum cable mounted on a drum that pulls the aircraft, that is a winch and that is put at the end of the runway. Okay. The other way in which you can launch a glider is called as aero tow. This is an expensive way but here is a flying school which tries to uh, sell itself by showing you how you can do. What is soaring? Webster's Dictionary writes soaring, the act or sport of flying a heavier than aircraft without power, utilizing ascending air currents. Those that choose to experience soaring will provide a more personal definition that expresses freedom and excitement from a truly 3D environment. What will be your definition? Watch as we take you on a brief flight, showing you what others have done and what you can do. The line crew takes the tow rope and connects the glider, joining the two aircraft. This is not a launch. This is just tightening the cable. Once the slack rope is out, and when the glider is ready, the glider's wings are leveled. So the glider is behind, wings are leveled. With the signal from the glider, the tow plane advances to full power. 250 horses for both aircraft to flying speed. Throughout the tow, the glider pilot demonstrates her airmanship, staying in formation with the tow plane. The glider pilot pulls a panel mount to release, letting go of the rope. The tow plane's job done. It now heads back with the rope, ready for another tow. These shots show the grace of long wings and lift, flown by professional pilots after a lengthy briefing. You can see there are wingtip devices to reduce the induced drag. And it's a light wing which is bending up because of the load. Okay, so this is called as aero two. How would you describe soaring to your friends? In which an aircraft pulls Schedule your flight and find your definition. And then the rope is released. This is expensive, but it is very common uh, in areas where there are many winch failures. There are complaints that winches get stuck. So this is also one very common way of doing it. Can you think of a third way? What would be the third manner in which you can provide the force for a glider, yes. One can start from a high ground and go down. Why? So one can use MGH, the altitude. Let us say there is a mountain, you go to the top. That is what we do in hang gliders. We go to the top of a mountain and then we jump down. Okay. But we are going to start from the level ground here. So what can you do? Anything else can be done? Yes, catapult. catapult launch is also possible but catapult is like a winch only, it is a type of a winch. Okay. But catapult normally is uh, slightly different because, but yes, I mean you can use it for launching. But I would call it like a winch type only. Any other way you can think we can do it? So we can do it by cheating. 
by putting a small engine on the glider and saying that oh this is a very small engine it just provides minimum amount of thrust when do we need it just to take off and whenever there is a problem you put the engine on otherwise engine is off and the aircraft is gliding such a launching is called as a motor gliding or a motor glider it's a small aircraft actually so here is again one of the best motor gliders available today is this one this is with the engine 1593 kilometers with the engine so glide ratio means l by d l by d is 36 in a glide sales video which says that you can do so many things you have so many choices so this is the engine 115 horsepower so this makes you independent of either an aero tow or the winch Okay, so these are the three ways in which you can launch a glider. Okay, now let's say you are an aircraft which has got an engine or multiple engines, and it fails. If you have two engines, both of them fail. If you have one engine, that engine fails. Okay, so what you expect is there is going to be a crash, is going to come down, but that doesn't happen. Okay. so let's see what else can happen an aircraft can also glide because an aircraft without engines is a glider so this happened in a very famous incident this is a very interesting video uh, and also when you come to the end you will know the reason why it happened and i'm sure you'll have a big laugh okay so this happened to a flight brand new aircraft boeing 767 purchased by air canada let's see what happened so i think this video is only a recreation we don't have the original video obviously so it's called as a jimli glider let's see we can get quickly what happens this jutta flight 143 it's a routine flight one they've flown many times before but this time No one on board knows they've only enough fuel to reach halfway. So a Boeing 767 recently purchased is on a flight. Everything is fine. Captain Bob Pearson and first officer Maurice Kintel believe they have 22000 kilograms of fuel when in reality they have only 22000 pounds a miscalculation with the fuel while converting volume into weight has gone unnoticed compounded by out of service fuel gauges catastrophic failure so they think they have 22000 kilograms of fuel but actually they have 22000 pounds of fuel and a pound is basically 2.204 pounds is 1 kilogram so they they are carrying 2.2 times less fuel which means they are nearly half so they planned a mission they filled a fuel and they only carried half the fuel needed so obviously the of the engines is now inevitable now everybody goofed up they are about to run dry not just the pilot the person who fills it the person who reports it everybody goofed up The left engine dies first. So the old engine it goes kaput. 
So one engine failure is not a big problem. Okay, many aircraft. At an altitude of 41,000 feet and only one engine, they decide to make straight for Winnipeg. Ah, so this is important. So the altitude is 41,000 feet, and one engine is not working now. It has just no fuel, so it has become it has shut down. So what they decide is they decide that they will go to Winnipeg, straight. Normally, an aircraft is flown along a particular route. So that is not a straight line. That follows the air routes. They will ask the ATC, give us a direct routing to Winnipeg as a safety measure, so that we can reach there as quickly as possible, because one engine is not working. Landing a 767 on one engine is difficult enough, but now Captain Pearson is in a deadly race against time. Barely able to accept the situation they're in, and against all hope, their right engine finally dies. The second engine also gone. Winnipeg, Air Canada 143. Air Canada 143, go ahead. We've just lost both engines. Holy cow. Their brand new twin engine jet has suddenly become a glider. But this glider, unlike any other, weighs 95 tons. <laughs> and has 69 souls on board. The plane is now descending 1,000 feet for every three miles it moves through the air, knowing its distance from the nearest... 1,000 feet is a loss for every three miles in the air. So you can work out the sink rate now. Okay. This is a question you can do in a tutorial. It's going to sink now. So at 41,000 feet, they have started their glide and they are losing a 1,000 feet for every 3 miles. So how much can they go if it is continuous? 20 miles? <laughs> That's... Ah, so the airport is therefore essential. With no engine power, the aircraft has only basic instruments working and these so won't give them the information they need. Because there are no engines, there are no instruments now. Only the mechanical instrument Winnipeg which I taught you, estimate their position vertical sphere indicator, airspeed indicator. Okay, uh, how far are we from the field now? You're 35, uh, correction, make that 39 miles from Winnipeg. So 39 miles away is Winnipeg. But with an altitude of only 8,000 feet, the news from... So now they have come to 8,000 feet. From 41,000 feet, they have come to 8,000 feet. Winnipeg is 39 miles away. They were losing 1,000 feet for every 3 miles. So, they can go 20 miles max. Wait, wait, wait. You are ahead of times. The co pilot is not good. But RAM is available, but what will RAM give you? Not ram, but rat. What will it give you? It can't give you power to fly. Rat only gives you power for lowering the landing gear, flight control systems. That was there. Otherwise, they would have not really worked. Because even to glide properly, you need to control the angle. So yes, they had rat. It came down. It worked. But it gave power for landing gear removal, etc. Let us see. It comes in the end. Bob, we can last maybe another 20 miles. Right. So now the pilot calculate that we can travel, if we fly in the optimum condition, we can travel 20 miles, Winnipeg is some 30 odd miles away, 43 miles away, so we can't make it to Winnipeg. So then they ask, where, where, do, where do we go? We are not going to make Winnipeg. The only chance now is to land at Gimli. Gimli is a decommissioned air force base with no control tower but it is only 12 miles away. Ah, so 12 miles away, there is a disused uh, Air Force runway called as Gimli. Now, because it is disused, there is no air traffic control, there is no safety equipment, nothing. In fact, to their horror, they realize that they don't know it, but when they go there, they realize the Gimli is now becoming a drag race hub. And there were people below running cars on the runway. And there were two cyclists on the runway when they came into land. So just see the fun now. The problem now is not reaching the runway, but overshooting it. They're too high and they're coming in too fast. So 
So now they are beyond the range. Normally a pilot can slow down his airplane by operating flaps. But without full hydraulics, they don't the have any. They perform now what is called a gravity drop. So understand the problem now. Earlier Winnipeg was far away, so you cannot reach. Now Jimli is nearby, but now you will overshoot because you are gliding and you will travel 20 miles, it is only 12 miles. So you have to now read in. Now how do you change the sink rate? by control surfaces, they are not available because flaps are not working. So they will do a gravity maneuver. On the main gear, they have to rely on the weight of a landing gear itself to lock it into place. The gear's air resistance will also help to slow the plane down. Increase the drag. But Landing only gear the been lowered. notices that the nose gear is not down. He no. decides to keep now the this nose to gear itself. was 50 percent jammed. It's <laughs> it no didn't go good. fully down. They're still too high and too fast. I guess I'll have to slip it. Captain Pierce now slipping. employs no glider pilot. Increase drag. Referred to as side slipping. He banks the plane fully left while stepping hard on the right rudder pedal. This is called crossing the controls. It turns the plane slightly sideways against the direction of travel, offering greater air resistance so that is and slowing Jim the plane down. The runway is Jim Lee. However alarming this may have seemed to all on board, he knows it's their only hope of getting down in one piece. There's one more surprise for Flight 143. They have an audience. The airfield is not empty as they'd hoped, but is being used as a drag racing strip. There are people on the ground. There are cars on the ground. Hey! Look! There! So they have side slipped, gone this way, and then gone this way, and then gone this way. Captain Pearson has never been so focused. He holds on for dear life, waiting for that sickening crunch. As his plane skids down the runway, Captain Pearson realizes he still has work to do. He pushes hard on his differential brakes in an effort to steer the plane away from two boys straight in front of him. <laughs> they were cycling. At last, he wrestles the metal giant to a halt. Now you see With the actual, no fuel, actual footage and no actual flaps, photographs very soon. Damaged landing gear and no emergency equipment. It was only the decisive actions and the superb skill of the flight crew of Air Canada 143 that turned a potential tragedy into a triumph. Thankfully, everyone was able to walk away from Air Canada Flight 143. And many things have happened to them since then. But they can be sure that they'll never forget the day they flew the Gimli Glider. Okay. So, now, interesting thing is what happened after this. So, you might think that uh, it's a very heroic act by the pilots. But both the pilots were suspended. Why were they suspended? Because they did a stupid thing of making mistake in units. Okay, they loaded fuel. They are from Canada. Okay, but the aircraft is now working. So they think it is in kilograms, but actually it is in pound. The aircraft came from USA. In US, they still work in FPS system. So the indications are all in FPS for the fuel indicator. So when it says twenty-two thousand, they think it is kilograms. Actually, it is pounds. Should not they know? They are supposed to read the manuals, they are supposed to be prepared. Now, the people who fuel the aircraft, they also goofed up. So, everybody goofed up and the emergency happened. So, both were suspended, the licenses were cancelled, and then there was an inquiry. After some time, they were reinstated, and then they went on 
uh, one of the pilots actually only passed away in 2015. Okay. So, so much about gliding. Now, let us go to climbing. Climbing flight is a flight. So, in the throttle of the aircraft, you have a position called as a climb position. This is a throttle of the aircraft. Uh, just to give you some idea, these two, these two on the right and the left are basically the trimming wheels. They are used to trim the aircraft so that the pilot can fly hands free. So, they are just the trim tabs and other things to ensure that the net moment is 0. And these two are the throttles. So, throttles you have, you can see there is a reverse position which is marked in yellow colored which is back and then you have climb position, then you have cruise position etcetera, etcetera. Okay. So, that means uh, this is Airbus A320. So, we have to be careful. First thing you have to be is that some people say oh climbing is basically reverse of gliding. In gliding you are coming down, in climbing you are going up, but that is not true. That is not true because in one case gravity is acting in your favor, in the other case you are going against gravity. So, you require thrust force to overcome. So, thrust comes into play when you go into climbing. Yeah, that is the important thing. And for different aircraft, there are different climb speeds and different climb positions. Okay. You can see the picture, you have a hang glider and you have a normal aircraft and you see there are differences in the way they are climbing. So, it depends upon the engine type. Okay. So, when you fly an aircraft, actually there are four possible ratings. Okay. So, the first one is called as the MTT. And that is basically the maximum thrust that the engine can deliver for 5 minutes. That is a max thrust condition. It is called as a max thrust condition. During this particular condition, you are actually creating a huge amount of thrust. So, therefore, there is a time limit. After that, the engine life will be reduced. Then you have maximum continuous rating, max continuous. This you can give for as much as time as you want. The engine is certified to work non-stop for many, many hours at that rating. Then you have what is called as a max climb rating. Okay. So, certified for en route climb. Now, climb also is many types, we will see that. And then you have max cruise rating, that is the thrust allowable for the unlimited flight duration at the design altitude. The MCT is at any altitude, but MCR is at the cruising altitude. So, these are the four ratings of the engine. Let us see the equations of motions. We first have a reference line and then we have this climb. So, obviously, we have thrust and drag along the flight path. We have weight normal, uh, I mean towards the earth center. Resolving, you get lift and if you have a climb angle phi, then you can look at the four forces. So, here we have a very interesting observation, but before that let me ask you, the aircraft is climbing. So, do you think lift is more than weight? It is climbing, it is going up. Okay. So, you think lift is more than weight, that is wrong, that is a misconception. Actually, lift will be less than weight during climbing. So, why is that so? Because there is thrust which gives you the upward force, not lift. In fact, if you have lift equal lift, to weight, drag, thrust, it will not and weight properly. are all balanced. What you see here is, of course, a simplified representation of the main forces that are in equilibrium. This one we know. This is in level flight. In a steady climb, the aeroplane is also in the state of equilibrium. Thrust and drag act in line with the relative airflow along the aeroplane's flight path, whereas lift acts at right angle to the relative airflow. Weight acts down towards the centre of the earth. The common misconception is that lift increases in a climb. In a steady climb, where the forces are in equilibrium, the component of weight points backwards. So weight may be resolved into two vectors. The weight component that opposes lift and the rear weight component. Lift is slightly reduced because the opposing weight component is also reduced at the expense of the rear weight component. The rear weight component acts in the same direction as drag, therefore it contributes to drag. 
So to maintain the equilibrium and steady climb, thrust must increase. This is called excess thrust. Are you still not convinced that lift is smaller in a climb? Imagine that this aeroplane is capable of climbing at the ultimate 90 degree angle of climb. Now you can see how it becomes about the excess thrust, not lift. An aeroplane will achieve its best angle of climb when excess thrust is the greatest. This curve represents thrust available against airspeed for straight and level flight. The faster you wish to fly, the less effective the propeller is, so the less thrust it's able this to generate. Or piston prop only. The thrust required curve suggests that generally you need more thrust if you wish to fly faster. Comparing the two curves, the greatest difference between the thrust required and thrust available is the maximum excess thrust, which happens to be your best angle of climb airspeed. Okay, so remember Vx is the speed, which is the Lift, best angle drag, of climb thrust speed. thrust and weight. So Vx is the best angle of climb speed that corresponds to the location where you have maximum gap between thrust available and thrust required. Okay. So therefore, interestingly, lift is going to be less than weight in climb, contrary to what we normally expect. L will be W cos phi and phi being non-zero, small number but non-zero means L is going to be less than W and T will be more than D because that excess thrust has to be created to overcome the rearward weight component. All right. So when you say study climb, again we mean constant speed okay, and what else? No change in the angle of climb. So it is a constant angle, constant speed that is the called as a steady climb. So there will be no dv by dt, no acceleration along the path. So resolving the forces, you can get a very simple idea that the rate of climb will be actually the dh by dt, the vertical component of TAS and that will be a function of the climb angle that will be sin phi, so t minus d by w. So if you want to have a better phi, other things remaining same, either you have more thrust, less drag, lower weight. So weight is something which is fixed, so we cannot touch it that much. You cannot throw passengers away or you cannot say I will dump half the fuel and climb better, maybe you can in an emergency, but in general W is constant. D will be a function of the aircraft configuration, yeah it changes with flaps and landing gear etc. So mostly what you can do is control T minus D. Okay. So the rate of climb will be basically the true air speed into sin phi, that will be the dh by dt. So remember ROC or RIC will be dh by dt will be V sin phi, where V is the speed during climb. Okay. So let us see. Uh, so R, R by C by definition is basically the true air speed into T minus D by W. So the rate of climb will increase when either TAS increases, that means if you fly at a faster speed and you go into a climb, you will be able to go into a better uh, speed or if you have more excess thrust or if you have lower weight, it is very obvious. Now this already we have seen in the video. This is how the drag which is equal to thrust in case of level flight, here drag is going to be less than the thrust, thrust has to be excess. So you can say that this is the drag of the aircraft, there is one velocity at which drag is minimum and that corresponds to if you remember CD0 is equal to CDI when the two power powers are equal. Okay. The thrust for a jet engine remains almost constant, actually it changes slightly but you can assume it to be constant. So therefore, and for piston in an aircraft it is going to come down. So the red line is true for both the aircraft, the numerical value may be different, but that does not depend upon aircraft type, the shape is the same. The shape of the thrust with the jet or thrust with the piston changes, 
okay so therefore the shortest time to climb is where the now here we come to power because now we are looking at time that was rate now this is time so if you want to go for time to height then you look at the power available versus power required which is nothing but t into v okay so now the way in which a transport aircraft climbs is a very different from what you think it doesn't go straight up it follows a particular sequence okay so the first step is called as a constant ias climb and then you have a constant mark climb so let's see so up to a particular mark number typically 0.8 or so the pilot is requested to climb at a constant indicated air speed and then once you reach that mark number then the pilot is asked to maintain a constant mark number and change the speed accordingly so for a airbus a320 this is the given time climb profile 250 knots 300 knots 0.78 so 250 knots is below flight level 100 or below 10,000 feet because of the air traffic control restrictions you are asked to fly at a constant speed of 250 knots above flight level 100 till you reach the height at which your Mach number reading is 0.78 you are allowed to fly at 300 knots and then when you reach m equal to 0.78 you are asked to maintain same Mach number till you reach the end of the climb or you reach the cruising altitude. So this is the climb profile now why do we do it because of the atmosphere so on the left hand side we have a curve which is power available versus true air speed and it it follows this particular sequence due to the change in the temperature and there is an effect on the thrust on the right hand side we have two lines one is the red line which is the theoretical line for the rate of the climb and then we have a green line which is the real aircraft rate of climb or the actual ROC. So typically what we do is up to that particular kink altitude you fly at a constant speed and then you proceed to a constant Mach number okay. So first part of the climb constant IAS, second part TAS reduces it is a constant Mach number climb. Now, many people ask a question that why is it so that aircraft fly at a particular height for example if you look at helicopters we do not normally go beyond 10,000 feet unless you have a special requirement like operating in Siachen or any other high altitude uh, requirement piston engines aircraft generally do not go beyond 25,000 feet turboprops 41,000 jets can go to higher they do not normally go beyond 36, 40,000 but they can go up to 51,000 if possible if required. So why is it so that they fly at different altitudes? So that is explained in this short video. Would fly at types and probably used to it, but the fact is, when we travel by air, we are way up there. The average cruising altitude of a commercial jet is seven and a half to eleven kilometers. In horizontal terms, that is at least as far as the average distance between you and the nearest Starbucks at any given moment. In vertical terms, well. That's a long way down. The good news is if the plane starts to fall, it has a long time to figure out how to stop falling. But we've been flying that high ever since the development of the jet engine in the mid-1950s. And jets were designed to fly at these high altitudes because there's less air up there. And that's what engineers, passengers, and airlines all prefer. Basically, there are far fewer air molecules at, say, 30,000 feet or 9 kilometers than at sea level. So the plane is literally running into fewer molecules. This means it doesn't have to produce as much thrust in order to maintain the speed necessary to fly. So it can travel more efficiently, which is what the airlines want. What the passengers want is to not feel like they're flying in the air at all, and flying at higher altitudes means being able to fly over at least some of the weather patterns and air currents that older, less powerful propeller planes often had to fly through. So flying higher usually means a more comfortable flight. But there are some trade-offs for this efficiency and comfort. In order to stay in the air, an airplane needs to maintain lift, the force that counteracts its weight. At lower altitudes, 
having lots of air around helps a plane get lift, but the higher it goes, the harder it is to maintain. So engineers had to find ways to generate more lift in other ways, like making planes with larger wings. Jets can't fly too high, though. In order to, like, continue working, jet engines need to burn fuel. That is an important part of the process. And to burn stuff, you need oxygen. So planes have to stay at altitudes where there's still enough oxygen to mix with the jet fuel and allow combustion to happen. To get any higher, your aircraft would have to pack canisters of air to mix with the fuel, and once you do that, you're not an airplane anymore, you're basically a rocket. So engineers have done the math and found the optimal height for efficient travel and designed planes to operate best at that height. Yay, engineers! Thanks to our few frequent flyer types are probably used to it, but the fact is, when we travel by air, we are way up there. The average cruising altitude of a commercial jet is seven and a half to... Okay. Very fast. After all, it's a jet aircraft, so he wants to go at high speed. So let us break down what he says into bits and pieces which we can understand. First thing he says is, planes fly at a high altitude because the density of air is less. So therefore, at a given speed, it will encounter lower drag. And therefore, if thrust can be produced, the amount of thrust needed will be less. But as you go higher up, even the thrust available will also change because the same mechanism also comes into play for thrust production. You need more air, you need more oxygen, therefore you need more air. So if you have a rarer air molecules, you have rarer oxygen. So there is a sweet spot, there is a place something like 36,000 feet to 45,000 feet wherein it is the most optimal, the drag reduction and the thrust availability are in sync and that is the kind of altitude at which most aircraft powered with jet engine would like to fly. Turboprop and piston props are worse hit with density change. So therefore, they would like to fly at a lower altitude. Their optimum altitude tends to be 25,000 to 40,000 feet. Okay. So, one reason is they said jokingly that if you are at a high altitude, then you can have a longer glide if the engines fail, but that is not the reason why they glide so high. So, it is basically a function of what is optimal from the point of view of fuel consumption and efficiency. All right. So, similarly, now let us look at the climb speeds. So, this is a slightly interesting part. There are various types of speeds in climb. One of them is what we have seen, that is the Vx. Okay. The other is the rate of climb. So one of them corresponds to what is the best angle for you to climb. The other is the one that gives you the best rate of climb, dh by dt. And these speeds are called as Vx and Vy. And then we have a normal or cruise climb. Okay. So you can see now max angle of climb. So this is basically in here you are interested in knowing what would be the rate of climb. So you are concerned about dh by dt here. The other thing that you are interested in knowing is what would be the angle at which I should climb, so that I can have a best angle of climb. So they are both different and there is a reasoning for that. So if you want to clear the obstacle height at a smallest possible distance, you need to fly at maximum angle speed because you want to reach a height at the shortest horizontal distance. But if you want to reach the altitude of your intention in the shortest possible time, then you have to go at a speed which corresponds to the maximum rate of climb. So let us see Vx versus Vy on the chart which shows the rate of climb versus the true air speed. So the rate of climb actually varies like this with true air speed. It increases below a particular speed you cannot climb. At some speed you have ROC equal to 0, that means just lift equal to weight, that is the stalling speed. After that you have excess power, so you are able to climb, but the excess of T minus D is small, so therefore the ROC is small. 
So, the point where the line is tangent to the r by c line would be the best angle speed and the point where it would be maxima the r by c will be maximum that would be the maximum r by c speed. Notice that v x is always less than y how do you remember because x comes before y. So, therefore, v x is less than v y you have to remember these things right in some manner otherwise it will be difficult when you are given only 15 30 seconds in the quiz and when it is more than one can be correct then you have to remember these tricks to remember the answer ok. So, if you want to look at the constant IAS climb you can notice that the percentage climb capability that means how much of the energy can be used for climb it also changes with the altitude or the height to which you want to go. So, as an aircraft climbs its true air speed increases therefore, drag will increase because drag is a function of true air speed not indicated air speed and if the drag increases then T minus D will reduce. So, therefore, the R by C, R by C also will reduce. So, that means slowly if you start increasing your speed continuously you will get lower and lower R over C at some time you will have 0 R over C. So, that is why it is very important for us to know the difference between the power available and the power required. So, the minimum power for piston engine will be at a tangent uh, at a horizontal tangent to this line. So, that will be at a speed called V x p, p stands for power propeller engine aircraft V x is the minimum speed and the maximum difference between the power available and power required will be at a higher speed V y and that is called as V y p again y is the uh, symbol for max ROC speed and p for turbo prop piston prop. On the same graph if I want to now show power available for a jet engine aircraft it is T into V, T is almost constant for a turbo jet uh, for a turbo jet engine aircraft. So, 2 into V will be, will be a straight line proportional to V. So, here you find that you have V x j and V y j at a slightly different values. So, looking at the graph what do we see? We see that V x is always less than V y which we have already seen before and also we have seen that typically V x p and V y p, V x j and V y j also have the same relationship. So, here are the important points for you to remember always V x is more than V y. For jets it is higher than piston both for x and y because these intersections take place at a slightly larger velocity. Now, what happens to these values with the altitude? They do not remain the same. So, they also change with the altitude. My name is Rob Machado and I want to thank you for attending my Aviation Learning Center. I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered why VX and VY, the best angle of climb speed and the best rate of climb speed respectively, change with altitude? Well, perhaps I can offer you a different angle from which to look at this particular question. I want you to take a look at these three rate of climb curves. There's one for sea level, one for 5,000 feet MSL and one for 10,000 feet MSL. Now, each curve represents the rate of climb for a typical small general aviation airplane at three different altitudes. And the very tip top of each curve represents the maximum rate of climb for that particular altitude. Now, unless there's been an oxygen shortage in your neighborhood, it should be pretty apparent to you that as altitude increases, the maximum rate of climb decreases. I want you to take notice that the top of each curve shifts to the right slightly as altitude increases. In other words, as the maximum rate of climb decreases with altitude, the airspeed at which this occurs increases slightly when measured as a true airspeed. And this is found by dropping down to the horizontal axis of the graph which is calibrated in terms of true airspeed.
And by the way, the reason I'm using true airspeed on the horizontal axis instead of indicated airspeed is that it allows us to more accurately represent the airplane's performance at various altitudes. Since the green dots represent the best rate of climb speed at three different altitudes, it's pretty clear that VY does indeed increase with an increase in altitude. Now, let's create three lines running from the origin of the graph and tangent to each rate of climb curve. The point where the line touches each curve, the red dot, represents the best angle of climb speed, or VX, okay. which is similarly found by dropping straight down to the graph's horizontal axis. Geometrically speaking, the slope of each tangent line running through each red dot represents the maximum vertical gain for a given distance traveled horizontally. And we know this to be the classic definition of the best angle of climb speed. The important thing to notice here is that the best angle of climb speed also increases with an increase in altitude, but it does so a little bit faster than the best rate of climb speed. Therefore, Vx and Vy as true airspeeds converge on each other as altitude is increased. Now, here's the plot of Vx and Vy as true airspeed values on a traditional graph. So ask yourself, what airspeed would you need to indicate to achieve each true airspeed value for Vx and Vy at sea level, 5,000 feet and 10,000 feet MSL? And the way to find that out is to use your E6B computer. And as you can see here, at 10,000 feet MSL on a standard day, we need an indicated airspeed of 65 knots to produce a true... So now, now he goes into the piloting information because he has plotted the graphs in terms of true airspeed. But pilots do not know true airspeed normally. Pilots only know indicated airspeed. And you cannot tell the pilot, oh, VAS is equal to AS into root of rho. So take a calculator, calculate the density at 5000 feet, okay, 6.5 degree per kilometer, mar jayega. by that time he will crash. So they do not do all these calculations. Today they have a small computer with them. Earlier they used to have these slide rule kind of a system. So they would inbuilt all these values into these kind of handheld devices where they would enter uh, IAS and get the equivalent airspeed, subtract the various errors listed in the placard and then get the value of true airspeed. Modern day cockpits have an indicator in front of them, but that is there only on very advanced aircraft. On very small aircraft, on GA aircraft, you may not actually see always the true airspeed. So then you have to do these kind of things to figure out. Airspeed of 77 knots and an indicated airspeed of 69 knots to produce a true airspeed of 82 knots. And when you do this uh, for all the other airspeed values, you get these indicated airspeeds. Now, let's take our indicated airspeed values for Vx and Vy and plot how they change with altitude. Now, here's the graph that you're probably more familiar with. So, why does the best rate of climb line here, in other words, the Vy line, tilt to the left? While Vy, the best rate of climb speed, increases with altitude as a true airspeed, it just doesn't increase that quickly. Therefore, the indicated airspeed value needed to produce any given true airspeed value decreases at a slower rate for Vy than Vx as altitude increases, and that's why the best rate of climb line tilts to the left and converges with the best angle of climb speed line. In fact, the point at which they converge is the point where the airplane has zero rate of climb, also known as its absolute ceiling. So there you have it, a brief explanation as to why Vx and Vy converge on each other as true airspeeds and as indicated airspeeds. So even if you plot, if you plot the, if you plot the true air speeds, then they will be little bit, both will be inclined towards the right, but they will meet at some point. If you plot indicated air speeds, then they will actually be like a vertical triangle. The Vy value will be reduced actually, okay. And the Vx value will still be increased, but not at the same rate. The value decreases at a as indicated. So this airspeed. is what you will get if you use indicated. Now, there is something called as optimum climb speed also, which is the speed at which the aircraft is actually made to climb. 
this is not driven by either vx or vy this is driven by economics yeah no no do no wait 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 what did you say did they don't have a landing gear or an engine do not confuse between landing gear and engine they are two different things they don't have an engine agreed but they have a landing gear yeah yeah they have a landing gear you have seen it it uh, in the shop in that in that super uh, in the video that i showed you it shows in fact the landing gear was retractable type with hydraulics they have see there are three ways of launching one way of launching is with the engine that is a motor glider okay but even a normal glider how will it roll on the ground it has a small landing gear it could be fixed in many cases the landing gear of the glider is half the wheel single wheel half outside half inside so that drag is minimum but there is landing gear and then in the nose they have a skid they have a skid a skid is basically a small piece where you rub on the ground so what they do is they they come they they land on the main wheel so they have a landing gear they don't have an engine but they do have a landing gear okay and in some cases landing gear is retractable type because it depends on whether it is going to give you lot of benefit it will because drag will reduce drastically but then there is a complexity issue weight complexity cost so there is a trade off there are many gliders in which you have a you have no engine but you have a landing gear which goes inside okay but in most gliders you have a fixed landing gear but a very beautifully shaped one so that the drag is minimum the most common one is a single main wheel one small tail wheel but then when you land on the ground you have very long wings so they will hit the ground this way or this way because it is very difficult to land perfectly like this and then remain like this it will go this way or it will go this way so on the tips they have a small support so that it can rest on the ground okay so the engine is not there but landing gears are there okay so coming back to the optimum climbing speeds so we are looking at efficiency and operating cost when we fly an aircraft for money for commercial purposes so these speeds are usually higher than the best rate of climb speed you are not interested in having only the optimum rate of climb that is just the numerical value what you want is higher efficiency so there are some factors which affect this optimum climb speed when the weight goes up this speed goes up so heavier aircraft climb at a higher rate if the fuel price goes up normally the speed goes down and maintenance and crew costs are are higher if ocs is higher so this is something i want you to find out and report on model why is it so and how is it done remember this is not for gliders this is not for sail planes this is for only commercial aircraft in other words i am saying that commercial aircraft do not operate at either vx or vy they operate at ocs optimum climb speed which is slightly higher than vy okay so your job is to find out why and report it on model okay moving on to climb gradients basically a climb gradient is an indication of uh, how much altitude is gained per unit horizontal distance and the unit is basically 100 feet in this case so it's like how much do you gain in 100 feet horizontal distance okay so it can be called as a ratio of the horizontal distance to vertical distance and this is affected by wind and by many many other factors so let's see the factors one is pressure altitude so if you are at a higher altitude and if you are taking off then your climb gradient will go down and therefore the roc will go down temperature is also very bad and weight obviously so all these three affect the climb performance of an aircraft in a very negative fashion okay this is also something which i don't want to cover i would like you to do it yourself so it's a homework for you to load on model effect of altitude effect of temperature effect of weight on the climb performance why is it so that this climb gradient reduces and the roc reduces if you go into now this is a interesting concept that 
remember i told you that as you store as you as you climb up slowly you are consuming fuel and your speed is in your uh, density of the air is decreasing so what will happen is the rate at which you climb is going to become very slow and it is also not permitted okay so why do you think why do you think you are not allowed to continuously climb when you go into a flight what is the problem as a passenger aircraft you are taking off from an airport you want to reach the cruising altitude and then you want to cruise what is the problem the pilot would like to do this because as you are as you are climbing you are consuming fuel so you are becoming lighter so therefore you would like to go continuously up in fact if you want to let's look at a short range flight let's say mumbai to pune flight now in mumbai to pune flight we have these mountains in between but suppose there was a short distance flight with no mountains and no constraints what would be the best profile to fly what do you think will be the optimum flight profile for a short distance flight so the answer is if you want to fly with minimum fuel consumption you take off from mumbai and you keep on climbing till you reach a height from where if you descend you will hit pune this is called as a saw tooth but what is the problem in this yes what is the problem in saw tooth flight i'll change it no problem do not get worried about climb speed i want optimum from fuel consumption so the optimum from fuel consumption is i will keep on adjusting the speed to whatever gives me the minimum fuel consumption and then come and descend so what is the problem not only mumbai to pune even if i have to go from mumbai to new york this is the best trajectory for minimum fuel keep on going up reach cruising altitude above which you don't want to fly because it will lead to more consumption then you fly level and then far before just keep descending slowly so what is the problem the problem is you, you are not alone in the aircraft in the in the sky there are other aircraft flying and who manages them the air traffic controller okay and they will go crazy if there are 100 planes each of them are ascending and descending slowly then how will they keep a track of where they are it's very difficult so it's the atc who say sorry i should know where you are because i have to separate you so one way of separation is by altitude separation 2000 feet gaps you give the aircraft one behind the other in the same direction so the atc would like you to quickly go to some cruising altitude which they will assign you and they will say maintain that so that i know you are at flight level 280 at so and so time the next aircraft who is coming i have to put it on the same altitude so many minutes behind you or so many nautical miles behind you okay so it's the atc who is going to complain so the pilots would like to have a continuous increase in the altitude the atc would like you to fly constant altitude so that they can keep track on you so both of them have a compromise and that is called as a step climb or a stepped flight so uh, the dotted line is the optimum altitude at which you would like to fly and the red line is the one that atc gives you so this is also called as cruise climb so you cruise at some altitude and then your weight has reduced now the optimum altitude for cruise is 2000 feet above this to tell the atc give me a new flight level so for those few minutes 3 4 5 minutes the atc knows that this guy is climbing you climb and then you again go level then you keep on reducing the fuel you reach another distance where now the fuel is so less that the optimum height is 2000 feet above you 
So again you stop, that is called as a cruise climb. So typically from here to New York you may have three steps like this in a flight, okay. The last thing for today is operative ceilings, okay. So ceilings is very straightforward, basically what is meant by a ceiling? That is not the ceiling, our ceiling is basically to do with altitude at which the rate of climb has reached some minimum value. Notice it is not 0, it is some minimum value. Okay. So depending on what is the value, there are many ceilings. There is an absolute ceiling where the value is 0. Then you have service ceiling, you have combat ceiling, you have design ceiling and you have propulsion ceiling. Now this design ceiling and propulsion ceiling normally we do not talk about it that much. But the first three are very commonly talked because the first three are actually driven by the rate of climb, okay. You can numerically decide absolute service and combat ceilings whereas these two are based on the propulsion and the structural properties of the aircraft. So let us see what they are. Absolute ceiling is very simple, you just cannot go above it because the power available and power required become exactly matching, they are tangential and you can fly only at one speed when you are at that ceiling, okay. So suppose you reach the absolute ceiling, now you can fly only at one particular speed. If you fly faster, you will fall down. If you fly slower, you will fall down, right. Now imagine you are flying at that particular altitude and you encounter a mountain. So what do you do now? The mountain is higher than the value of absolute ceiling, okay. You can circumvent by turning. So if you are very near, then you cannot do anything because if you go low, you will hit it and you cannot go higher. That is why it is dangerous for an aircraft to fly at altitudes near absolute ceiling because the reserve capacity is very poor. So that is why we define some other ceilings, okay. So what are these other ceilings? The first one is propulsion ceiling that is the altitude at which the thrust provided by the engine allows you to reach. Above that the thrust available is not going to help you. So it is a bit lower than absolute ceiling. Absolute ceiling is the aerodynamic parameter where the ROCs are matching where the ROC is 0, but before you reach ROC 0, you may reach thrust not available condition. Okay. Then you have service ceiling. In service ceiling, we want to have a reserve climb capacity of 500 feet per minute. It is not meter per second, it is feet per minute. This is considered to be from safety point of view, so that if you have a mountain in front of you, at least you can go 100 feet in a minute and avoid it. Then you have design ceiling, a ceiling at which you cannot go because of structural limitations because delta P atmospheric pressure keeps falling, pressure inside. So the delta P across the structure should not become so much that the structure breaks. So the engine is okay, but the structure has failed that is design ceiling. This we will see later when we study VN diagram also. So finally we have these two speeds, you can notice the best angle of climb speed and the best rate of climb speed. So you have absolute ceiling, service ceiling and then you have this cruise ceiling that means you should not cruise at a height higher than the one at which the rate of climb is 300 feet per minute from safety point of view. Then you have combat ceiling, this is for military aircraft so that you do not have, you are not a sitting duck target because now you cannot climb. So these are numbers which are commonly used, okay. Next time when we meet, we will take up sustained level turn and pull up.